Welcome, friends. Time for another live stream. It's Wednesday night for probably most of you. Otherwise, you're listening on the podcast or live somewhere not in America, which is equally, if not cooler. It's not cool in here. I'm up in the Dragon's Den up here with the fireplace on. It's about a billion degrees because it's nice out. And if I'm lucky, uh, a couple weeks from now, a vent will finally make its way to this room and maybe some cooler air could uh, circulate through here. But we'll have to rely on fans and armpit sweat stains today to power this live stream. All right. I've just learned to live with duckweed. My worst duckweed incident in my underwear. Went to the bathroom, went to pull up my underwear, and I was like, my gosh. There's duckweed now in my underwear. So that's, you think it's good when you put in a bathroom in your fish room. You start playing with fire. Uh, so yeah, ask me how I know. Hopefully you guys brought some questions. Catching this one live again. That's right. I think there's one more, maybe two more before I got to go to China. So there's going to be a lull for two or three weeks again. So get them while the getting's good. Yeah. Tomorrow I've got a tank being delivered from customaquariums.com. Got to be around, so I'm going to work in the fish room and uh, wait with the forklift so I can lower that new 125 with stand and everything. It comes in this gigantic plywood box that uh, I'll probably just set in the fish room because I got too many projects going on that I need to work on before starting a new project. So it'll sit in that plywood for a while and just stare at us. All right. 53 months being a member not bad how's it going it's going pretty good what i like about sunday or sun, it's not sundays anymore it has been sundays in, in months what i like about wednesdays is it is the uh it's the end cap of my um like business week and what does that mean that means i line up all of my meetings to happen monday tuesday wednesday so that uh, the rest of the week becomes family and fish room and hobbyist. And so like tomorrow, waiting on my aquarium to come and I'm going to work in the fish room all day. And that's much more enjoyable than sitting through meetings with HR and lawyers and, you know, expansion stuff and, and all of that. All has to, all essential to the business by far. But, uh, you know, the Wednesday live stream kind of loosens it up for the rest of the week. And I'm excited. I think this Sunday our farmer's market opens. So we might make our debut at the farmer's market and see what kind of trouble we can get into. You never know what kind of handcrafted thing or vegetable you might go home with. So we will see. All right. Mm. My white clouds, just out of the blue, died. Half of them. It's not ick. It's not dropsy. But I don't know if it's velvet because they're golden white clouds. Yeah, some fish make it crazy hard to see if you have velvet. And a golden white cloud would make that hard. I would recommend turning the light out, trying a flashlight. That makes it a little easier sometimes. Uh, but I, I, I will keep mentioning this trick that someone said just turn the lights out when you're fighting velvet. And it really helped. I saved probably 80-90% of the, of the glass catfish when they got sick in the fish room. So... They, to this point, are still uh, doing well. So I, I learned something. That's that's what I like. I like learning new things. And I don't, it's so simple knowing that you know, when you research something, sometimes when you first get an illness or a new fish or a new plant, you spend all this time researching it before you buy it. And then even though I've been keeping fish for 20 years now, you forget things like, yeah, it is. It does need light to replicate and everything. And why wouldn't you turn out the light? And we normally did at the store. But at home, I wouldn't always turn out the light because I don't need to tell customers, hey, that's not for sale. No one's in my fish room. So, uh, yeah, that really helped this time. So salt plus that really worked on this particular strain of velvet for me. And uh, I'll keep recommending that because I think it's a pretty safe recommendation of no matter what strategy you're going to use, what med or salt or whatever, uh, turning the light out definitely helped me, so. All right. I look tired. 
I am tired. I've been working. Uh, that's why I'm wearing the the ultimate tracking eye watch or whatever they call it to track my sleep. And I'm continually working on optimizing and making it better because even though I would be asleep for, uh, you know, in bed and asleep for maybe eight or nine hours, I'm actually only getting between four to six hours normally. And so doing some things to optimize, um, you know, that it, it turns out if I stay up later in the day or in the night, I sleep more soundly. So if I go to bed at two or three, I will still get six hours of sleep. Where if I go to bed at 11, I still only get six hours of actual sleep and rest. So uh, still working on, on maximizing or optimizing that, which is good. So it means I'm kind of getting some time back in the day, which is good for me. I've had a guppy explosion. Now I'm overstocked till I get a new tank. Is it best to run larger filters for overstock? Honestly, you probably don't need a bigger filter. Uh, maybe some water changes, maybe higher quality food, but um, it's kind of like knowing you're going to have a, a a big family party on the weekend, right? Everyone's coming over to my house. We're cooking. There's going to be a bunch of kids, everything like that. And, you know, you're going to end up putting more trash in the trash can, right? That's your filter. Just keep throwing it in there because you're cooking. You're doing all that stuff. You could either buy a giant trash can and take it out at the end of the weekend, or you can take it out more frequently. And that's usually what you'd have happen. So in a temporary situation, you're just going to, yeah, I'm going to do a water change once a week if you were doing it every two or three weeks. Or maybe you're going to service your filter twice a month instead of once a month. And I, I hesitate to tell you to spend more money uh, because I don't think you're going to get the reward that you're thinking you're going to get of how easy it's going to be. There are ways to optimize. Maybe you put a, a sponge on the intake of your filter or you optimize the inside or maybe you need a little more air in there. There could be something, but uh, the default bigger filter, most times uh, I don't find that it pays dividends for people. It's, it's kind of like, I got a new job. Should I buy a new car? So I look the part and it's like, no, you go to work to make money you don't buy something super expensive for no reason to go make the money, right? Kind of the same thing going on there. Like, eh, I don't know. I, I would, I'm always a little more uh, reserved when I'm spending someone else's money because there's also the fun of, I'm going to go buy a filter because I'm bored and I want to do that. That's worth entertainment value and all of that anyway. For, for me, a guy like me, I'll nerd out playing with a new filter, seeing what I like about it, what I would change, and then... You know, then I know more. Love the yo-yo loach in the thumbnail. Is it a yo-yo loach? I thought it was a, a rainbow shark. Am I wrong? Let me look. It is a yo-yo loach. I thought I chose the other one that had a albino rainbow shark in it today. But turns out, we're going yo-yo. Which, by the way, I actually kind of love yo-yos. I was, before I got into gaming or anything like that, the middle school, like the early middle school, late uh, elementary school, yo-yos. And you better believe I had the brain yo-yo. That thing was like $30 when the yo-yo guy came to town and uh, did their display at my school. And uh, I think my grandma bought it for me. And I, I wore my finger like raw and broke so many strings with that thing. I can still do some few few tricks. Kind of the yo-yo. I want to be that yo-yo guy. I never grew into him. Uh, Cotton asked this question earlier, and for whatever reason, it wouldn't let me reply earlier. Um, in my live stream, are we asking the right questions about aquariums? I had mentioned that having more than a quarter inch of soil would be harmful to... The ecosystem, I'm assuming it's not meant to say ecosystem, which that is kind of funny. I, I want to use that as a, a backhanded compliment sometime, like, <laughs> you're keeping an ecosystem, not an ecosystem. Can I elaborate? Yeah, so in my experience, anything more than a quarter of an inch gets brought into the water column too often, meaning you're replanting or a fish digs. The other thing that I've seen a lot of people run into is the more organic material you put down as that base layer 
it has more of a tendency to create the gases and bubble up and out of it. So that's why one of the reasons we're putting so much substrate over those layers is to help prevent that. And in my opinion, when I, so if I don't see a benefit, then I see the detriment. And so if the benefit is growing plants well and providing nutrients, I get all of that benefit with a quarter of an inch. And as I add more of a quarter of an inch, I'm only adding downsides to that ecosystem. And so that's why I don't recommend adding more than a quarter of an inch, you know, because you, outside of just following like a recipe, right? Where a lot of times that's what we're doing. We're going, hey, this person, their tanks look good. I like the way it looks. I'm going to follow what they're doing. But in that live stream of like, are we asking the right questions? Ask yourself, well, why did we choose one inch of soil? Why not half an inch or 10 inches or four inches or 11 inches or eighth of an inch, right? And so I, as a hobbyist, I often ask myself, well, how do I know what this person knows what the heck they're doing? And a lot of times I find they don't, or at least with the way I keep fish, I go, well, I'm going to try more stuff. And that's where I find stuff I like better. Maybe this fish keeper, you know, like maybe Dr. Wallstad, when I was reading her books or book and, and playing with it, you know, the, I think the longest thing she had running was about seven years at that point. And as you looked into the forum, I don't know if she still posts cause I think she was catching too much hate, but on, if you're, if you're old crusty guy like me, you know, I'm 40 now, if you went back on like planet tank forums and stuff, every once in a while you could find her username and where she was posting and she would answer some questions and some updates. And I think outside of the book, she had found that actually doing a water change like every six months was beneficial for the way her ecosystems were running and uh, running some oxygen. Now, that being said, everyone keeps different fish. Everyone's keeping different plants. Everyone has different water structure and even the soil you might use. Like I typically would was buying organic uh like miracle grow with no additives because it had very few kind of sticks and and little pine cones and things in it and it was pretty uniform and worked well for me and yes i tested more and less and uh, it wasn't just me at the time i had um well, anyway, i saw some aquarium buddies but the aquarium buddies and i we were trying different ones and what we found between all of us that were doing it, it was that less was more in that situation. The, the tanks were more stable. There was less tannins. You had less ammonia problems at the initial get-go. And you still got all the vibrant plant growth. And that was that was our metric, right? So a lot of times when you're trying to figure out something, what is the metric of success? What are you measuring against? And good plant growth, healthy-looking plants, and a stable ecosystem was the metric we were measuring by, uh, not so much you know, am I going to run out of nutrients in year 28? Because at the time, we were like 24 or 25, right? So it's like 15 years ago. And we know we're going to have to move and tanks get broken down and we change our minds and what plants we want to keep or what style of fish. And these weren't tanks that were going to run for 10 plus years. And so we never saw any limitation into soil that we were using in terms of running out of nutrients. Um, but we uh, what's the right way? How do the right way to say this? All of us over the years got away from using soil. Everyone saw the benefits, and then over time, each person stopped using it and would go, Well, now that I'm resetting up, I'm not going to do that again. Each one had their own little different reasons, and so I got some people want to try new things, some people uh, just didn't like the mess if they wanted to, to take out a plant or when they went to move. They're like, this really made a mess and I don't like that. And I know I'll have to move again in a year or two for a job or whatever it was. And, uh, you know, some of the, some of my friends would be moving, you know, state. I don't know why my internet likes to crap out on us. Okie dokie. So yeah, that's, that's why I, I think more than a quarter inch in my experience led to, uh, a worse off ecosystem. Am I doing okay? You keep making videos for us and keeping us happy, but am I okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. I heard it, or I saw it was 1 a.m. there, Philip, where you were from. Um, 
yeah, I'm doing okay. I'm playing, mostly I'm playing with anything but aquariums at the moment. Uh, really been nerding out with some ferns in my yard. And uh, I dethatched it last week. And then I, I bought a, uh, a lawn aerator or a plugger to tow behind my mower uh, off of Craigslist. So I've been outside soaking up some of those sun rays and stuff. And, uh, but you know, now it's time to, to work on the aquarium. So I'll be doing all that all day tomorrow. When are we going to open a store in Canada? Probably never. And even if we wanted to, the logistics between international, uh, tax situation is just a nightmare. I watched Dean go through it. Uh, I've been through it a little bit and it just, you're, you're in a constant fight between governments on who do you owe money to or in addition to. And so that's just a headache that's not fun for anybody. And so that probably, you know, checks the box of we will never open a physical location in Canada for those reasons. Even though we're like two hours we could be in Vancouver, BC. That's right. Fern Goley. Corvus was over on the weekend and... Uh, his significant other and himself brought us like 50 ferns from uh, one of their other friends who is getting rid of some ferns. So transplanting ferns, keeping nature. I'm, I'm trying to get more or like less yard, more nature. And I think they might have a toddler or something. So they were trying to get a little more yard for the toddler to play. So just moving nature around. Hmm. I'm scared to do vids in my five gallon tank because there's so many haters out there. Yeah, there's a. Uh, the internet is full of hate. That that's not really up for debate anymore. Uh, that's just a thing, and I think what happens is over time as a creator, you get more jaded to it, and find ways to dodge it and avoid it because. They're, they're the best things you can try and do in the world, someone will hate on you. You could say, I raised a billion dollars for breast cancer research. And there will be 12 people stand up in the room, but why not these causes? Or did you know that there was one person over there that did a thing one time that made me upset and I can therefore never support them? And he's kind of like, yep. I, I, so is the answer I do nothing? So my... my uh, my advice, unless you're trying to make a career out of being a creator, which is a, a kind of a whole different conversation, my advice would be um, maybe sharing like on our forum. You can post a, a video to YouTube and kind of keep it unlisted or whatever, and then you can go into uh, like our forum and you can post it and keep a journal and that kind of stuff. And what's nice about both like the Facebook and the um the forum is we have, we've got mods and we basically play referee. You know, we, we, it's a fine line, uh, between discussion and, uh, you know, hate. So sometimes we'll get that wrong, but, um, in general, I'll let things run their course if I can until people start attacking each other. And then I have to shut it down. And that, you know, that happened in our, our Facebook group today. Um, you know, people with the success of Father Fist's channel, more people are finding him, and uh, people are very vocal about it. And so it's fine to discuss any method of aquarium keeping. It's not fine to, you know, start wishing people would die and, and, and just getting into it. That's not what we're about. That's not what our groups are about. And really, it's not what you should be about. I don't think anybody uh, starts off with, you know, I assume at some point you see a fish tank, you see a fish, and you go, wow, that's awesome. I would like to have that. And you don't go, ooh, you see that fish over there? I bet you I could send death threats to someone over the fact they're keeping that clownfish in a four-gallon cube at the moment, right? So I, I, I try to, you know, it's same with politics and religion and all of these things that uh, really divide the public. It's not that they're not important issues. It's that I find that once those things come up, there's no there's no oxygen left in the room to talk about what everybody originally wanted, and that was 
fish and plants and aquarium keeping. So uh, we do our best to moderate that. That's our job, the, kind of the peacekeepers and keep things on track. Not, you know, don't let people blatantly advertise. Don't let people hate on each other and, uh, you know, try to try to take on each person for what they are. And are they well-meaning here or aren't they? Okie dokie. Harvesting live brine shrimp? That's right. How does cool fish equal death threats? Yeah, that's 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 honestly the question. There's been death threats against me, my wife, my company, my employees. There's uh I watch it happen every day in Facebook, you know. That's that's the question is how do we get to a point where two people thought fish were cool to, you know, like literally at one, like we had a ban one two weeks ago and it was because uh, Facebook was going to shut our group down unless we banned them. And that was because they wish they were wishing the other person's house would burn down. Right. Like it's just people get on these uh, these tangents and uh, they're, you know, I now that I'm 40 and I'm, you know, I'm dang near ancient. I try to at least go, they just are probably having a bad day. There are definitely people that are just looking for trouble all day long every day. There are those people. But it's easier on me if I just assume they had a hard day at work, they've got family problems, something outside of their control is making their life worse, and they are doing this and trying to separate it out. That's what I, I find best for people. All right. I want to hear alternative ways to keep fish and love hearing deep, different people's takes, and I adore it. But sadly, with everyone going, with everything going on, I'm staying away from it. Yeah, that's kind of what happens is you get these these factions that develop, and I, I think what happens is you have staunch defenders of one side and staunch defenders of another side, and those are each... 15%, right? So you got 30% of the people who really care about any, uh, you know, this thing that's being talked about. Then you got 70% of people who are just like, they just don't care. They would passively listen and go, hey, maybe there's something to take away from it. They're not passionate about it. They're just going, yeah, you guys are, you know, having your nerd fight over there. I get it. I'm going to go back to, it's my seven-year-old daughter's pizza party tomorrow. And after that, I'm going to stop by the fish store and, and buy a fish to put in my tank. That's, most of the entire aquatics market, you know, 98% of fish keepers never watch a fish YouTube video ever. So, you know, I, I once you once I learned that, and it took years, right? Because YouTube becomes your whole world when you're a YouTuber. The easier it was, it was to just, yeah, I don't, I don't watch other people's videos. I don't worry about it. Yes, we get attacked all the time, whatever. Uh, because when you go and you see people in person, that's a good time. There have been people that have been critics in, in person at events too, but, you know, there's lines of hundreds of people deep that, you know, want to say, hey, I'm enjoying what you're doing. Hey, I have a question. Hey, I'm enjoying this hobby. And those are the people you create for. You don't create for the haters. So, or at least I'm sure there are some people that do. I don't. I create for the people that, uh, you know, sitting at work right now and they're wishing they were playing with their fish tank instead. That's what I'm doing. Puffer's rule. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Mm, let's see here. Might be late to the party. Anyone see Aquarium Co-op help the feds locate a Russian spy? Depends who you ask. Some people would say we're harboring Russian spies. No, uh, and that just shows how crazy, like, as a company, we could not be more careful, basically, about our public image outside of, having the CEO on YouTube being a loose cannon all day long. Uh, but we we interviewed someone who is local that was keeping fish and, and doing stuff, and it turns out that they somehow got wrapped up in some governmental conspiracy Russian type stuff years a couple years later, and uh, it gets tracked behind. You can actually look it up and find, like, Aquarium Co-op is in this weird roundabout way associated. It was actually interviewed by the Aquarius podcast, who at the time Randy was working for us, but that was not our thing because they were sponsored by Awaze, which, as you know, I hate Awaze, so we wouldn't, weren't allowing that. Uh, but then eventually we folded it into our stuff, 
And then because we're a bigger company than random, you know, Aquarius podcast that wasn't a company, the articles wrote us into it to make it seem it make it seem a little more uh, juicy, if you will, you know. And uh, yeah, I've never even met the person. I know other local YouTubers and other people that have you know bought fish from the person and 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 that kind of stuff. But um, you know, our involvement was. Yeah, one time they interviewed and they seemed to have good fish information and everybody enjoyed it. And then a few years later, you're like, huh, that is nuts. I would have never guessed that. So the world's a weird place. That's what I know. I'm literally at work on a call right now. That's called multitasking, my friend. <laughs> What's up with Awaze? Uh... Mostly, the battle between myself and Oaze is they don't want to take criticism because their products are German engineered and the best that have ever been made. Even though, if you followed their manual, it would flood your house. I think they did fix that eventually. And then when I met the product developers in Germany at uh, at uh, Interzoo, they admitted that the like in the the cancer filters, which I, I do think they're overpriced, but at this high price point, they better be insanely good. And I don't think they hit that insanely good mark. If they were, if they were a notch down in prices, I'd have less of a beef. Uh, but the bottom basket in all their marketing is like, look, this fluidized media, it's so efficient, so good, right? And the problem is they keep it in a netted, uh, netted sock. So the media can't move. And I literally talked to the guy that designed it. And he's like, yeah, I know. He's like, but marketing loved it. And so we're doing it. And I was like, that's kind of all I needed to know. Like, all I need to know is marketing matters more than the way that actually works. So, you know, that's, and there were, you know, there's a few other things with that. But, you know, it's mostly, I can't stand it when I'm trying to help someone. They ask, well, let me back up a couple steps. They were sponsoring the Aquarium, uh, Aquarius podcast. And they were dying, I shouldn't say dying, they really wanted to get Aquarium Co-op involved because we're popular with the people, and we would help launch their brand in America. And I'd say, no, I'm not interested, no, 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 no. And then eventually they send a bunch of stuff to Randy and me, and I go through it all, and I'm like, look, okay, you, you send it all, there are some ways we could make this better. Here's my ideas. I think you should be coarser on the sponge on the intake of the Waze, which they ended up doing, by the way. They actually did do that change. Uh, your manual, if you follow it step by step, actually floods yourself. The heaters in the canister are actually a liability. We know this from selling Aquatop UV sterilizers for years. What's the liability? Everybody lifts it up. They set it off to the side, and their dog, kid, themselves, significant other, kicks it or steps on it and snaps that thing happens like almost 50% of the time of the customers that buy it within the first year will break it. That means they got to sell another one. I don't like that. Even though it's like, you've sold another heater. I don't like that. You know, at that premium price point, you shouldn't have things that you knowingly are like prone to breakage. And the reason I was going through the manual so much was because if you don't spell it out correctly of disconnecting you know, the power to the heater before you lift that out, you're just going to fry the heater anyway. And that's where the steps would actually like, you never tell them to turn the shutoff off. You're going to drain the aquarium onto the floor, right? And then they were working on a hang on back, which is now out by the way, and has not cornered the market at all. And it was still in development, 3D prototypes. And I was like, oh man, I would love to help you guys launch a Hang on back filter. It's been a dream of mine to really do a new filter. I got a bunch of ideas. And that's when they're like, we have a German engineering team. We don't need you. Okay. And I was like, yeah, but we're still in 3D prints. Like, even if you just send me one, I'll give you my feedback. Like, I can help you. And instead, what they put out, they put out uh, a white and a black filter that is, in my opinion, unremarkable. Because it hasn't done anything uh, to really change the game. And they did classic mistakes that I would have tried to avoid, like clear intakes that you have to clean all the time and uh, stuff like that. So that's that's the history of the Waze of like, yeah, it's just been, you know, I, I've i met different people on the teams and I like them, but uh, they are a big company that, you know, they bought out what BioCube and they bought out some other stuff. And 
I kept trying, even when I was in interview, I was like trying to find a way to like continually like, there's got to be a way to repair this and like work with them. And they kept, they wanted me to push all of their, their aquatic stuff, which most of it is rebranded stuff. Like they have an Awaze mag float and I call it a mag float because it's literally a mag float in the exact same design in every way, except it says Awaze instead of mag float, right? So they bought the rights to it. So there's that. They had the the ecosystem for terrariums. I was like, this is super cool. This is maybe like this is new, innovative. It's done really well. The guy that invented the whole thing, been working on it for like the last fifteen years, was there. I liked that guy. He was impressive, and it was amazing. Until you found out the prices were like in the two thousand dollar range for for a tank like this big, and I was like, this is just dead to market. It, it, it's, you know, so few people can afford a $2,000 terrarium. I, I get it that it follows the moon pattern and it, it, it follows, you can set it to be like, I need it to be this rainforest or that for the amount of humidity and all of that. I get all these bells and whistles, but $2,000 for like a 20 gallon terrarium is dead to market. And I still haven't seen it make waves yet, but it, it was super cool. I will not say it's not super cool. But I measure everything with how cool is that compared to how much money it costs. Because there's a lot of cool things that cost a million dollars. I don't I don't endorse them because I don't have them and I never will. You know, so you have to have it be affordable. If that thing was seven hundred bucks, five hundred bucks, right? Somewhere that seems to be more attainable that someone could save up and be like, this is the best reptile habitat or best terrarium I could ever have, and you save up for a couple years, that makes some sense. And then there's the this thing is too grand. Like, whoa, okay. So, yeah. So they were willing to give me some, and I was like, I just, I can't. Like, they're, you know, I, I, I think it's super cool, and I would love to have one, but I don't want to. I, I think it looks bad when you're like, I got it for free. You guys should totally buy one. And the reality is, I myself would not pay two grand for it because I think it's not worth it. So, if I myself wouldn't make the purchase. I don't show any of that stuff on the channel or anything. So, you know, like the custom aquarium stuff, I'm actually buying them. So I would pay the money. They are very expensive, just like the big tanks for, for Ladybird and Murphy and all that kind of stuff. There is a market for expensive stuff and there people buy it. Is the value there though? That's what I care about because not everyone's going to buy a $20,000 aquarium. But if you were, is the value there? Will it last you a lifetime? Is the stand powder coated? Is it two inch angular steel is it extra thick acrylic is it all of these things you would look for in an aquarium that big that would need to be on display like that so yeah that that's uh you know that's that's the waze history now i will say this there i i try to always maintain that uh, there are always chances to still work. Like I would still work with Fluval. I would still work with Awaze, Dennerle, all of these companies that we haven't seen eye to eye in the past. But every day there's a new VP in these companies and there's a new thing and a new initiative and a new and a new and a new thing, right? And so you don't swear them off forever. You just go, hey, things aren't lining up today. Maybe they will someday. And... That being said, you do carry some of the baggage of like, remember that time you basically, you know, threw me under the rug and beat me? Yeah, you're going to have to make that right, you know. So there, there is some of that, but, uh, you know, I'm always I'm always looking to do good things. If they called me up tomorrow and were like, guess what, we're doing a new hang on back. Would you want to be a part of it? I would be like, yes, if you will truly work with me. Not that I know everything, but we can crowdsource this, we can show it to the public, we can get a much better you know, widget if we all work together and I don't want to just be like, well, we partner with you, put your name on it or anything like that. It'd have to be actual. And I'm very forthright in that I will make lots of decisions that will cost you money, but it will be better for the customer. Like, oh, but the cost is going to go up and we don't have to do that. Yes, but you want a filter that will never be beat or that's what I want. And so we will pay more money to make that happen. It's my quality H2O right there. By the way, the last last little tidbit, the uh, the booth at uh, at 
at Owase or the booth and the, the thing they did where they brought in all the vendors to feed and all that stuff. I, I heard the price was like $2 million. They were only going to use it for four shows, which it's nuts. Like there's a bunch. There's got to be venture capital money behind that company because they're buying up other companies and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it's kind of nutty. They started out as a pond company. Now they're in cancer filters and, and some other stuff. And, you know, I, I hope... I, I always hope that uh, they will become a more like aquatic central company. But the guy that's the president right now, he he, he looks like he should be managing or uh, the CEO of like Apple. The dude, he's got wicked good style, super nice. I think he was in interior decor, like some giant mega business before they brought him over to Awaze. And that guy knows how to put on a party and make things look good. I have no idea if he knows how an aquarium runs, though. So, you know, I, I hope that there's more of that aquarium side. Any thoughts on the Florida fish ban? I don't know. I don't know anything about it yet. I'll have to do some Googling on it because I don't know uh, what's uh, the latest stuff with what could be going on in Florida. There's always so much going on. Is the care for the Mabu puffer the same as a Cross River puffer? I don't think so. I've now seen a Cross River puffer in person a couple of times in uh, in Germany, and from what I I remember talking with them, they were they were much more aggressive, and it was not the same care level. So they were attacking me through the glass and that kind of stuff. But I have not I have not uh, I've not kept them, and so. Maybe that's just how they hang out at a wholesaler versus settling in from the wild two years later. I don't know all those things. So I, I would say right now, tentatively, I don't think it's the same care. But being that I haven't kept both for a long time, uh, they could be exactly the same. And maybe someone is already doing that and they've got a better opinion on it than I do. But I've never kept one. They look super cool, stupid expensive still in the thousands of dollars. Uh, but I, I was pining after one for a long time because I thought they looked really, really cool. And then when I got to interact with them, when I was interacting with them in person, I no longer, I, I would try one, but it'd have to be like 500 bucks or less, not the $10,000 or $5,000 you're buying a group of them. They, in general, I, I, you know, as we all have fish keeping preferences, my preference is not to have super aggressive fish most of the time because I like to mix them with other fish. And, uh, you know, if I, if I have employees around my tanks, I don't want them to get hurt. You know, we've new hires are always afraid of Murphy, like, cause his jaws are so powerful. They can go through bone and skin and all of that. But the pets that I keep, they're very docile. You always respect them though, because if they were having a bad day, they could still take your finger off. You know, we always make sure like, no, no, no I, I, you're getting too comfortable. Like you don't, you know, you don't want to be hand feeding and letting them get close. Like you use tongs or you drop them in. Because one day, four years down the road, you'll a customer will ask you a question, your finger will be a little bit too low, and you'll get the you know tip your finger bit off or something. And so, you know, these animals are very uh, can be very strong, and uh, you know, all the puffer mabu puffer kills that I've seen have always been on accident. Uh, that doesn't make their teeth any less damaging, though. So, you know, when it accidentally killed one of my eels and a corydora and these other things. You know, it shows you the raw power, and uh, you don't want to have that happen to a human, especially an employee or a customer or anything like that. And so you got to respect the animals. And knowing that the crossover puffer at least displayed to be much more aggressive when I was interacting with them the two different times over the course of a couple weeks, I thought, yeah, I'm not sure this is the pet for me, um, just because that's not my style of fish keeping. And uh, I thought I liked that when I was newer to the hobby. Things like Dovi, still a beautiful fish, very cool to interact with. Um, Midas cichlids, and uh, you know they're they're they are something to observe, and I am interested in. But I know my fish keeping; I don't actually want to own them. It's the same thing with like arowanas for the most part and stingrays. Very cool fish. I just don't need to own them, and uh, you know, for some reason I like to own a guppy instead, which to each their own, I would say. Oh, we got some gifted memberships. Johnny C coming in clutch. And five new people getting a membership. Those memberships, they're given out based on how much you interact with the channel. That could be watching long amounts, could be liking and commenting and uh, doing all of those things. 
and it keeps track of that and then tries to hand them out appropriately. If you've already a member, it won't give you another one. I'm sorry. Uh, but you can win them again if you are not a member. That being said, it's totally worth it. We have Dr. Tim Miller Morgan this week or this month. He is someone who I really respect. I've actually taken his class to learn how to uh, sedate fish, do gill scrapings, clippings, uh, lateral line scrapings, all of that kind of stuff. And so he is he is basically the aquatic wizard that uh, he actually in Oregon, I don't know if it's Oregon State University, but there is a school in Oregon in which he, for as, like as long as I've been in the hobby, so like it seems like the last 20 years, he was the whole head of the Department of Ornamental Fish College. I never got to take it because it was another state away and I always, you know, I've always been in the grind of like I had to work and then pay bills. And so it didn't make sense for me to try and go. And I, I did flirt with the idea the last, like five years ago of like, I wonder if I could just like take a few quarters, go live down there. My wife used to live in Oregon when she went to school and because uh, there's so much to learn. You you learn both freshwater and marine there, but uh, it's cool. He, he goes out once a year to... Uh, Project Piaba and helps him with that. And he also will get uh, kind of summoned, if you will, or, or, you know, I don't know exactly sure how the payment process works, but he'll go out to very, very big, expensive facilities around the world and offer, you know, kind of biosecurity and other stuff, um, ways to help set up the farm to make sure they'll be more likely to be profitable, or if it's like a big salmon farm that is losing millions of dollars a day. You fly that guy out and you get his best opinion on how we're going to combat that. And so he's kind of that aquatic wizard that everybody, like if you can get his time, it's worth it. And you guys can watch his talk for five bucks, which is amazing. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're lucky that he's only one state away. And uh, yeah, the only time I really tried to get a hold of him, he was actually in Peru when Hank, my first Mubu Puffer passed away. And every vet I would call, everyone would be like, you got to get a hold of Dr. Tim Will Morgan. That's the guy that's going to know if anybody's going to know. And uh, he was unreachable by phone because he was in the jungle already. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. He, he's he got a very cool style of teaching. He's the one that actually taught me that different strains of like ick and velvet uh, exist depending on what country in the world. And then when we see ick strains that are like heat tolerant or heat resistant usually originates from a country where it was already naturally very hot. And then some countries that are naturally very hot never have ick. So very cool things to learn of like, oh, all ick's just not the same. Where you order it from, that makes a difference. <coughs> so uh, very interesting stuff, I think. And and he's, it's not... What I like about talking with Dr. Tim Mill Morgan, it's not like speaking to a super nerd, even though he's wicked smart, he's a normal guy that puts it in normal terms and you could just ask him questions and, you know, you're like, oh, my, my fish is doing a thing and he'll just give you the answer instead of like, well, first thing you're going to do is apply your spectrometer and then you're going to do this. Like he's, he knows you're not going to have those tools available and so he's going to recommend actual things you could do and uh, I just think that's super cool that you know, he's got that knowledge base, basically. <sighs> All right. So it looks like uh, some some little bit of info without reading into it. I sat in on the Florida FWC Zoom meeting last week. I'm guessing FWC is like Florida Wildlife Commission or something of that nature. The FWC opted to ignore the Federal Fish and Wildlife... FL-ARC, another acronym, uh, the aquaculture lobbyists, and chose a white list. And for those of you that don't know what that would entail, assuming that those that statement I just read would be true and that it would get passed and all of these things, so we're just taking a very small nugget of uh, comment and, and talking about it. And there's always more to these stories, and they actually get huge and convoluted and start YouTube drama and all of that. But... Uh, the difference between a white list and a black list, that is something that's fairly easy to explain. Right now, most states work on a black list. And what that means is if something is on the black list, you cannot own it. So like in Washington state, I cannot own piranha. They are on a list. You look it up and you go, ooh, piranha, I cannot own that. 
I can not own crayfish. All these different crayfish will be listed. And so that's how it works. When you move to a white list, what happens is you can only keep fish that are on the list, right? And so where that kind of becomes problematic, in theory, in a perfect world, in an absolute perfect world, they would work the exact same, right? It's just one list and one list. But in a practical world, what happens when uh, Corey goes to Peru and he finds a really cool fish that's perfectly legal to export and all of that, but I can't bring it back to Washington State because it's not on the list, right? And so what that means is we need people that can uh, oversee a list that would know just about every fish on the planet and the likelihood in which it would thrive in different environments. That becomes a task that's pretty much impossible for any group of people to do a wicked good job at. The, the thing I think that uh, my brain would tell me is we're not actually looking for 100%. We're looking at, with a blacklist, we're clearly having problems in Florida and other states with invasive fish. And so that's not working at 100%. And so the lobbying and all of the things going on the hope is that moving to a white list, it would prevent as many invasives getting out. And then over time would be a pretty robust list that would be good for fish keepers. Then you sprinkle in some, all government is bad. They'll do this. This is the first starting step. And this, 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 this. And you can get all kinds of opinions going either way. And the reality is the average hobbyist like us won't really know what's going to happen because things like this type of stuff have been being battled out since before I was in the hobby and will probably still be battled. And, you know, like I know, uh, I actually contributed some money it was a thousand dollars, but at the time we were, aquarium co-op was very young and it was a lot of money for us to, uh, the lawyer defense fund to, uh, help with some of the stuff. And then, uh, there's things like Hikari has been doing the legal battle for like the last 20 years, basically, on getting red arowanas legal back into the country. But it's a very long, hard process to undo. And their logic is there's a, you know, they, they're now breeding red arowanas and they can breed them in massive, 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 massive quantities. And they're in Canada and they're microchipped and all of that. And we could easily bring those into America. If you don't know, the reason we don't have rare arowanas was because at some point we decided we won't allow the importation of those anymore because what was happening is the way they were harvested was not ethical, basically. And uh, you had people finding them in the wild, cutting their heads off, releasing all the babies, shipping them around the world, making lots of money. So a lot of the world cracked down on that for quite a while. Then it became profitable, right? It became profitable to breed them because they're hard to breed, a lot of raising, a lot of space. When it became, oh, these arowanas are worth $5,000, $10,000. And they started breeding them and now, okay, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000. And I think uh, at the time when I was talking with Hikari, they, you know, like the going rate was around 600 bucks. And so now that they're captive raised though, the original argument that stands for why we wouldn't allow them in the United States doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but the amount of legal paperwork to get through all of that has been quite the fiasco uh, to kind of fight against. And so, you know, there's always things going on, even if it's just one species or, um, you know, everything like a list all at once. And uh, you could spend all of your time learning about that if you wanted to and try to make a difference or not. And, uh, but I, I myself am a guy that thinks I will keep what I'm allowed to keep. And uh, I can enjoy almost any fish. Like, you know, we're fairly restrictive here. I can't go collect any natives. Lots of states you can. But we've got the Olympic mud minnow, which is super cool, but I can't legally collect them. And uh, there's more fish than I'll ever keep in my lifetime anyway. And even if you limited me to only what I could keep at a, at a chain store, Honestly, it would still fulfill my entire life. So um, I I like to believe the glass is half full on most things. And so even when something horrible gets taken into effect, I think over time things balance out. And uh, I, I hope the same for Florida. If, if something goes wrong, I hope it starts correcting. 
you know, we already seen things wrong with, uh, like lionfish and other stuff. And, and so, you know, there's, I, I think with anything in the world, there's always people that are super well-intentioned and people that are bad actors on the other side. Um, not that it's always pit like that. Sometimes you have two people that actually think these are both the best solutions and they're trying very hard to make the world a better place, but they're on opposite sides of what is the best. And so, um, you know, I, I don't consider myself to be nearly well educated enough to be the person that would make that decision. And uh, that I think is the fear that we all have is how could you even get enough people to make the decisions on what would or would not thrive? And we have changing uh, climates from year to year, sometimes it's really hot, sometimes it's cold. And we see that happening in Florida now where uh, you might get common plecos invasive, right? And you will get tens of millions of them in the waterways. And then they'll get a year where they get that cold snap and all of them die. And so, but I, I think if, uh, you know, you were asked like, well, could this live here? You would say, yes, it could. Whereas you don't really get the massive die offs in Peru and stuff. So it, it it's a, it's a very, it would be a very hard task. I would not want the job and any, any group of people that set out to do the job, there's no way you could make everybody happy. But I think there probably is a way long-term over the course of, you know, pick a long timeline and not just like, well, what would it be like tomorrow? I think over a very, very long time, um, solutions will arise that will work for lots of states and countries and, and things like that, that hopefully will will be, you learn, you know, as long as you have something that's trying to learn from previous data, it should get better over time. But uh, we definitely have a big fear of something coming into a law or something like that, and then not reviewing the data and not ever changing. And that's kind of, that's actually what has happened with our blacklists, right? If we were to watch what became invasive, we should start making them on the blacklist and going, hey, Florida, might be pretty close to some of the temperatures in Texas and, you know, that kind of stuff. And so we're very uh, disjointed as a as the United States compared to a lot of the other countries based on size. You know, you don't really get that a lot in uh, Europe from what I've seen is like you've got these small countries and they're, you know, a lot of them are smaller than one of our states. And so they're very similar in, in climates where, you know, even though we're the United States and we're kind of seen as one, there's so much variation between all of the land that it makes it really hard just to make uh, something that would be applicable for, for everybody, right? And so it doesn't make any sense that dojo loaches are legal in my state, Washington state, and then one state lower that basically has the exact same climate, they are illegal. And down there, piranhas are 100% legal, and here they are illegal, right? And so, you know, there's definitely room for improvement uh, no matter which way was to go forward. And and honestly, I think some of the good news is that we're actually, you know, we have the attention of the rest of the world of looking into aquatics, right? And and there's a chance for change. And I, I do think that change can be a good thing. It's not always, but it could be a good thing in that, you know, we could definitely use less invasives in the warmer waters and some of the colder waters. And, you know, we might have to give up and go, oof, but now I can't get some of these fish. And hopefully over time that would that problem would alleviate. Now, that being said, I can't read minds. And so either way could happen of like, Ooh, nothing ever gets added to the list again, or wow, we found the right aquatic wizard and they did it perfectly. So you never know. I'm in New Zealand. We are a whitelist country and it's so hard to get new species added. It's also not very logical for us. The blacklist is a better approach. I'm not going to get into it, but I would say that uh, hindsight is always 2020. In that, um, you know, you would say the exact opposite if all the fish were dead in New Zealand because this other fish got released, right? And so, you know, I, I, I like to think that hopefully people are trying to make the best decisions at the time they have to make those decisions. And I like to think that over time, hopefully, Decisions can get improved upon and things like that. And we are just uh, kind of living living through those decisions, right? And so, you know, in business and that kind of stuff, I always tell people that no matter who's the president or what's going on in the world or that kind of stuff, there's all these things always happening, whether it's COVID and this and that and this and that. There's always going to be challenges. And uh, it's our, 
not, it's our job, if you will, just to play by the rules. And I think that's that's the easiest way. And I, I realize there's people that would be very against that. I, I understand that. But uh, in terms of trying to have a filling you know, hobby, I would say it's it's much easier for me just to go, oh, I can't keep that. Great, I'll keep this, right? And I, I have a friend that lives in New Zealand, and he, he still keeps fish like I do. He's got lots of African cichlids. He's got uh, lots of guppies and that kind of stuff. And so, and I run into it too. There's stuff that I haven't been able to bring back from Peru. One of the fish that I really fell in love with that actually was not on a list here at all. It was on the Peruvian list as a food fish, even though no Peruvians ever ate that fish, right? So you just go, ah, that's a bummer. And you kind of go, well, okay, I'll keep these fish instead. And, uh, yeah, I, I honestly think that nothing too catastrophic is going to happen to our hobby. In the macro, in the short term, there could always be like this crazy decision led to this horrible thing in a short amount of time. But there is so much money with so many big mega corporations that uh, they will fight it and reverse it. You know, that will happen. And it's not going to be the mom and pops like an aquarium co-op. It's going to be the mega brands like Spectrum Brands that owns like all of the pet industry that will do it. Uh, and yes, could they be nefarious about it and make it so that like, oh, we're only going to get these pieces? Yes, they could. But as they do that, they're going to start setting precedents so that other companies could work on lobbying other fish. And over time, I think it would work out. But that's just, that's all the time I'm going to spend on it today because you could you could discuss back and forth what you think the future will hold, and you'll never know if you're right until the future's here. So um, that's my take. Yeah, were they the Brycons, the ones I wanted to bring back? Yes, they were some very cool big Brycon tetras that uh, you know even the natives we were there they were they were washing their laundry in that thing where we found it and they don't eat them. And, uh, everyone at the wholesalers and everybody talked to you like, no, you don't eat that fish. You eat big fish. You eat, <coughs> you know, stuff with meat on the bones. And, uh, they were never in big enough numbers to like catch miss sardines or anything. And so, yeah, they were super cool. We had really good underwater footage and all of that. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately they were classified as a food fish, which is no one saw it coming. No one knew that. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's how that is. Okie dokie. I know you get questions about this from time to time. Uh oh, what is it? One of my best tips for keeping red eyed, red tailed puffers. So I've never kept them in my own personal aquariums. I've kept them at the store to sell them. And so usually you're getting a window of like maybe up to three months. Um, but mostly my tip would be have a good snail farm going, nice planted tank and be ready for their aggression. Now, there's several types of red-eyed puffers and red tail puffers, and they get mixed up a lot, especially, like, I'm a puffer guy, and I still have a problem identifying them, and the wholesalers definitely. So we don't order them very often at all, and if we do, we let the customer know, like, look, there's a high likelihood it's not going to be the species you want coming through. Just know that to start with. And if they still go forward, then we do. And some of them are real uh, aggressive. Some of them are more timid. And everyone kind of usually wants the more timid ones that aren't going to destroy their tank mates and, and others. But sometimes like, uh oh, it showed up. I've got, I've got a, a problem, not a problem, but like I've got an aggressive one on my hands. And so, but the generality of a good snail population in a separate tank and planted tank sets you up for success no matter which type you end up with to keep a specimen and enjoy it. Have I ever kept freshwater sole or flounders? Uh, I've had them in the store. I haven't kept them personally. It's very rare to find true freshwater ones. There's lots of brackish ones that get sold. And uh, so when we would get an, uh, like Aquahuna or someone that swear that the freshwater... We would bring them in, but we would still warn our customers. And some of them would last many, many years, and it was great. But then you would get some that, uh, you know, I think kind of the layer before a wholesaler, sometimes there's some trickery that goes on there. And it's not necessarily even that wholesaler or that transshipper or that farm. It's the collectors ahead of that, right? 
So, you know, if you go to collect in the freshwater place and there's no flounders, but your family needs to eat, maybe you go to the brackish water section and say, hey, good enough. And then you get some mixed ones from there. So uh, I haven't kept them in person. I think they look super cool, but uh, I I typically go with like a reticulated hillstream loach or something that I've had success with and I like. And uh, yeah, I, I, I would say this. If I wasn't on YouTube, I would be much more... Uh, I would try many more things, but when you're on YouTube, I don't necessarily like to get the newest species because then you got to answer to them. You're like, I don't know. I've had them for a week and a half. You know, as much as I do kind of, and then every time something doesn't do well, you get the 2020 effect of like hindsight being 2020. See, you never should have done that. Even if you've got 10,000 people that say, yep, you'll have no problems. And 10,000 people that say, oh, that's a terrible idea. No matter what happens, you'll have an army of 10,000 people talking about it. So uh, for the most part now, I just, and after 20 years, I've kept so many different things. I kind of know what I'm going to like or not like. The thing I ordered this week, is it late enough in the day? I'm going to, let's let's see if there's still any left. This is the first time I actually found a super cool fish and I ordered it for myself before I told you guys. Because I just found out about it like on Sunday night or Monday. Let's see. Uh, do, 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 right here. Do they still have some available? They do. So I got some double longfin neon tetras. Hopefully they'll come in. And uh, I've been wanting those since I saw them in Japan like 10 years ago. And uh, yeah. So those will be in my fish room. Hopefully they look as good as what's in this picture. And I got them from Aquahuna. They're three for 36 bucks. They're not cheap. And these are neon tetras. And a lot of times they're pretty needy, as in the genetics are pretty inbred to uh, get those things coming out of them, you know, those extra long finage. But I've been wanting them and I'm willing to take the, you know, what's the update on them? How they, you know, did you kill them all? What are they doing? You know, how old are they? And. Neon Tetra could be like, oh, no, they got the Neon Tetra disease. I don't know how to treat it. That would suck. So, yeah. Any suggestion for a bottom dweller in a mid-flow, mid-70s, 20-long Rainbow Shiners tank other than Cory Doris? All right. So we got a kind of a, a midi, medium flow, 20-gallon long, and we don't necessarily want Cory Doris. Uh, what about something like, uh, rosy loaches? Those are pretty fun. Or Sid loaches, pseudomonkey loaches. I like those quite a bit. They get about that big or so. And then Hillstream loaches would be another one. And if you had deep substrate, I would also, uh, consider, um, horse face loaches. Just a moment. I, my wife doesn't know how to use the uh, the the new watering system. So she's watering trees right now in the ferns that we planted, and she's saying, hey, 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 turn the water on for me. So let me see if I can turn that on. It's going to be, I think it's that one. Let's see. Let's see if that'll do it. I hope she was, like, looking in the end of it and sprayed her in the face. <laughs> Not not to the point where you're like, ow, just to the point of like, you know, the the shock factor. Okie dokie. I'm doing my first summer tub this year and I'm in West PA. What water temp should I put the white clouds out and the platinum rice fish with them? I so someone was asking earlier and I said depending on the fish, so now I have the fish. I would say if the nighttime temps are over 50. You're probably good to go. Uh, just because a lot of times, <laughs> I don't know if my wife is being serious, but she just said, you just turned it on in my face. <laughs> I don't know if she's listening and trolling me or if it actually just happened. Uh, but I would say 50 degrees because a lot of times we're living in a pet store or in your fish room and we don't want a huge temperature difference if we can help it. So I want nighttime temps at like 50 or above for those fish and then 
I would try to put them out on a nice sunny day. Like today, really hot and sunny out. And hopefully that water temp's like, oh, it's 70-something right now. And then you put them in, and then it'll lower down as it gets, you know, towards the nighttime. So it's it's a much more gradual transition for them. All right. I can't get my fire eel to eat or come out ever, even at night. He's about two feet. And I've tried every type of frozen. Could the flow be too much without seeing your aquarium? It could. I, I doubt it. Like a two-foot eel is real powerful of a fish. But I would start with uh, changing things. Reduce the flow a ton. Does he love it? You know, you've tried changing the light. You won't eat at night. won't eat at day. Maybe try a blue light at night. You know, sometimes they're they're looking for like that moonlight to simulate the time they'd want to eat. The other thing I might try is uh, will he eat like feeder guppies after they go through quarantine? I would try um, rearranging the aquarium. Sometimes fish just won't eat because the aquarium's too small. Like maybe you're like, I've got this two foot fire eel. Like, oh, it's only a 75 gallon. Well, that could be the problem. They're just depressed. Um, but I would say it's a trial and error thing. Keep trying different things. Maybe if you don't have an error stone, add an error stone. If you, you know, just keep trying it to hopefully like, Hey, that's the thing that was, and that's the problem you'll find is let's say you've got 15 people all having a two foot fire eel over the last 10 years on the forums. One person said, I use garlic garden. It fixed it. One person said, Oh, I turned off the light and that fixed it. the next person said I had too much flow. So I turned that off and that fixed it. Or I got a bigger tank and that fixed it. Or I moved and that fixed it. And so you're going to have these 15 different, uh, like, answers to the same problem. But the reality is it was diagnosed of just like, oh, that thing's not happy. And depending on what was wrong is what will make it happy. And so I think it's a trial and error thing to figure that one out. The co-op freeze-dried foods make it easy to leave feeding instructions while I'm away. Yes, it does. I definitely use that while I was away. It was one cube of these is how I fed the uh, glass cats and uh, silver hatchet fish because they have to have that floating food. Everybody else was mostly on feeders. That one can't have a free feeder because they would fly out of there. So, what am I, What's my opinion on Prozzi Pro? Uh, that's a med that I do love. Uh, it's very mild, I find. So I, I'm not sure I've ever really lost fish to it. I mean, I'm sure I have, but uh, it seems to be taken by fish really well. Prozzi Pro is higher strength than... Uh, uh, my brain is... What do we call it? I, I want to say the, the metronidazole, but it's Prozzi Quentinol and metronidazole in the... Do, do, do. Paracleanse. That's what I was. So Paracleanse is metronidazole and prosiquentanol. But prosipro is a higher concentration of prosy. And so uh, sometimes I'll use that to deworm stuff even further. And I like that you can kind of dose it once and let it sit for a week. It will make your water super bubbly and everything. And I find it to be fairly cost efficient. Let me look at it real quick here. We've got instructions. So a four ounce bottle will treat 480 gallons. And that only costs you $12.99. So being that you can treat very big tanks for 12 or 13 bucks for some deworming, I do like it quite a bit. Now, Corey, why don't you use that instead of Paracleanse? Well, I really like metronidazole too. And so the fact that I get metronidazole and prosequentinol in the same med, even though it's more expensive, and a little bit more work to do, time is money at like a retail store and for my videos on YouTube and stuff. And so we will usually invest the higher amount of money to get that result. That being said, on animals that we know we're really making pets long term, a lot of times it'll be uh, like paracleanse. Uh, and then we take a week off and then we paracleanse again two weeks later. Then we take a couple weeks off and then we might take a month off and then prosy them and really try to make sure they're super cleaned out before we're going to try and raise this fish up to adulthood and, uh, you know, but, <clears throat> you know, Murphy, I think he's just getting old. People keep asking, you know, like, is he okay? And, you know, his, his vision's not as good. And the reality is time has been flying. And I bet if we look back, you're like, this thing's probably closing in on, you know, 
seven or eight years old, probably. And, uh, you know, there's some reports that they can live to be 30 in a public aquarium. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure what the actual timeline, and, and not that I expect them to die tomorrow, but, uh, you know, as, as, as any pet ages, you're going to go, well, yeah, my dog at six months doesn't run around like he does at six years or 16 years, right? And so even though, like, my, my uh, Chihuahua Sassy lived to be 18 and a half, like, at 15, she was slowing down quite a bit. And even at, you know, we had her for six or seven years, I think. And, uh, you know, even at 12 when we got her, I think she was 12 or 13 when we got her, you know, she had pep in the step, but not nearly like you would when you're a three-year-old Chihuahua. You know, back in my day when I was a three-year-old Chihuahua, I could run laps. Would a single electric blue Jack Dempsey do okay in a 75-gallon tank that is well-seasoned and I have four jewel cichlids? Well, my answer would be it could, and also it could be a death tornado. Sometimes jewel cichlids love to just attack stuff. And so if you were going to try that, I would definitely have a backup plan, or I would choose... If you don't have a backup plan, which of the two do you enjoy more? Do you enjoy like the jewel cichlids and the breeding and the four billion fry... Or do you really want to see a specimen electric blue Jack Dempsey grow out? Maybe you've had the jewel cichlids for five years and you're ready to try something new. Don't know what your setup is. Could be could be the jewel cichlids are brand new to you as well. And you're just trying to find compatible tank mates. And in general, my response to jewel cichlids is jewel cichlids kind of do best as specimen tanks when they breed. They can be real nasty if they if they want to be. Happy birthday to Murphy, whatever day that is. I know, you'd think I'd be better at record keeping, but for for most of my career, I was just trying to stay in business, and uh, there, was just, there wasn't time. So if you follow me on Facebook now, so if you actually go to Facebook and type in Corey McElroy, you can click a follow button. More often, I'm posting updates to remember, to get reminded of. And so, like, uh, I think it was last week we, I posted that we'd gotten over 100 stores. We're like 105 now, I think. So I want to remember that day of like, because it's growing so fast. Like a year ago, I don't even think we had one store. Or maybe we had one, right? And what if like in five years we're at like 900 stores and then it shows up and you're like, oh man, can you believe that? Uh, remember that first 100 stores? We never even thought, we didn't even know this thing would become as successful as it has been. So uh, we definitely are onboarding some stores and stuff. So if you want your local store, most times I find you got to handhold them, meaning you got to be like, here's the link, here's the thing, here's their products, here's what I really like about their products. Because if we try and do it, they just think we're trying to sell them stuff, which obviously we are, but they don't think we have their best interest in mind. And uh, so it usually goes a lot easier if, if the customers are actually saying like, hey, we really want these. We're already spending money online. We could be spending it with you. Here's the link. Here's some of the, you know, that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in that, help us out. If not, I get it. I get it. My, like, chat is frozen up. Maybe maybe I'm not even online right now. Is this real life? Yeah, why is my chat all frozen? That's not good. Or maybe no one's been talking for a while. I'm going to hop over here. People are talking. My chat's just frozen over there. Okay, now it caught back up. Woof! How's Elmer doing? Elmer's getting big, and he desperately needs his cancer filter cleaned. For the last three weeks, I've been like, I gotta do that. And then I get busy. So tomorrow is actually a top of list is to service the cancer filter. You might ask yourself, like, how do you know you need to do it? The flow is low, and I would rather have... So how I actually noticed it um, is that there was starting to be some muck building up for feeding more food because it's getting bigger. But then there's some muck developing, not muck, just like mulm and poop settling near the, the like pieces of fake wood and that kind of stuff. And uh, like that was the first sign of like, oh, the flow must not be enough because normally that flow was getting it into the filter. So now it's collected enough fish poop that I need to get in there and, and de-fish poop it basically. And so... It's on my to-do list, and I look at it every day while I'm feeding. Like, do I have time today? Like, ah, I got to go to the next meeting. 
But next time I'm in here to really do some deep cleaning, because this is, and boy howdy, this is why I hate cancer filters. It's going to be a 45-minute process. And I know four people said, this guy takes 45 minutes. What a fool. I do mine in a minute 17. This guy. It's a big, bigger FX4, and they are going to be loaded. So I'm spraying, 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 squish, 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 spraying, 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 squish, squish, squish. And I'll be wet. It'll, it'll take 45 minutes to get that thing clean. And that's what I you know hate and love. The fact that I can go a long time between it. But then when you got to clean it, like, oof, it's going to be rough. So. Justin E. Donating a membership. Who got it? Party guard got it. Thank you. Have I ever experimented with pothos in my tanks to replace cancer filters? I definitely have videos on doing that, and I've used lots of pothos over the last 20 years. I haven't gone so far as, like, could this replace my filtration? I always used plants and pothos, which is a plant, I know, uh, in addition to. Because I always still want air, and if I'm going to have air in a tank, my thought is, why not have a sponge filter also? And that's just been, it's, it served me very, very, very well. And so I don't buck that system because it's, it's, I, you know, it works well for me. FX6 is definitely an hour job for me. That makes sense. Got another row of baskets. It's, uh, you know, it just, it just work and it's not fun. And you're, I also try to like, cause I have the sprayer. I also get fish poop on me. And so I try to, I try to make sure I'm like, don't wear a white shirt and then also, like, what else I got to do today? Do I don't have to, like, go out to dinner or anything, right? Like, I don't want to show up as the mole man. That's my new, my new costume, by the way. I'm mole man. Uh, let's see here. Would you remind me how to treat with Ickex for velvet? Ickex, in my experience, will not treat velvet. So maybe you're the exception, but being that we use ICX by the gallons every year and we routinely still really, really struggle with velvet, I would say probably not going to do it for you. What we use, what, well, I don't, we don't even have a, we don't have a good process for it. So what I do, and I had velvet in my fish room and what I would do tomorrow if I had velvet is I would use salt and I use uh, I use one cup of salt per uh, 20 gallons and I turn the light out. That would be what I would do tomorrow if I had it. <coughs> what happened to the mangroves that you and I or Dean and myself put in the ponds? About 50% of them thrived. 50% of them did not thrive. And then I sent some home with Dean and some other people as I was knowing we were going to take out the ponds. So now I don't, I think, I don't even know if I have the one anymore. I used to have one, but yeah, I don't even know if I have any setup right now. Uh, there was another thing. Oh, uh, why so many water changes with the med trio? My thing would say, all right, well, here's what I would tell you. Go watch the videos and read the articles because I feel like if you understood it, you would know there's basically like no water change with the med trio. Usually you just would dose and then wait a week. Uh, now, if you're using, if you're asking why each individual medicine on the package would say to change lots of water, I would say 50% of that is... They make more money that way. 30% of it is covering their own butt. If you change some water, it's highly unlikely you could overdose. And then 20%, probably some chemical reactions I don't even understand. So, uh, but what I've found that works really well for me, and this is just me, you do what you want, is uh, letting it set. The only one I don't really let it set, so... If it's a bacterial infection, dose once, let it sit for a week, works well for me. If it's internal parasites, dose once, let it sit for a week, works well for me. If it's ick, 
I do dose it and change every day because one dose of ick does not get it for me. So an active ick infection, I will change water every day and dose every day. All the other ones though, I, and I'm not a scientist. I, at best, I'm a backyard uh, fish room guy. In my experience, I have not noticed the other meds being erythromycin and the prosequentinol and the metronidazole to diminish enough that I need to redose when I'm treating my fish. Now, that being said, I do treat them more than once. And if I have a prized possession, I'm going to spend all of the money and keep trying it. But like with, with Murphy, for instance, or with Ladybird, she had a skin infection going on. I dosed it with an $80 bottle of, of uh, erythromycin, which I went with the, the Fritz version because it's cheaper. So the Maricin, same active ingredient. Erythromycin EM uh, from API costs a billion dollars and is erythromycin. From Fritz, it's Maricin. They call it Maricin, but it's erythromycin. And so it costs you 80 bucks to treat the 800 gallon. And uh, I dose it once and let it sit for a week. Guess what? Fixed it. And that's been my experience, experience time and time and time and time again. And so that's why my recommendation is like, but the first thing I will, I will admit this. When you challenge me, when you say, are you sure you should do that? I go, no, no, just follow the directions. Because I, I can't be wrong then. So the, the minute you go, I don't know if you know what you're talking about, Corey. I go, great, follow the directions. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just a guy that mixes water with some fish sometimes, and I enjoy it. And you asked me what I did, and I told you, and then you said, I don't know. And then I said, great, follow the directions. Just follow the directions. Like, that's, it's, it's, it's kind of like if you ask someone, like, how do you make your cookies taste so good? Every time, you know, every time you... You make those cookies, they're amazing. And you say, my secret ingredient, it's a little bit of cocoa powder. And they go, no, cocoa powder, I had a spoonful, it tastes like garbage. Then you're like, great, then don't do it. You asked me, I told you, and now you don't believe me. All right, follow the direction. On the back of the chocolate chips, it's got a recipe. Just follow it. Done, moving on. So yeah. All right. Have I tried using garlic to help with internal parasites? I have. I've used like the Thera A from New Life Spectrum and some garlic soaks. The jury's out for me. I've, I I don't think I've seen it where it's like, look, that's a miracle. It's better. I also haven't seen it get make it worse. And so I've used garlic in things from time to time. And most times I don't now in the hopes of hopefully this will help. Not from a standpoint of I know this helps. That's why I'm doing it right? So let's say Lady Bird or Murphy was super sick and I'd be like, well, it probably won't hurt to put garlic in, but I'm not going to go, oh, garlic will get it for me because I don't have that experience to draw from. And so maybe others do, but I myself haven't found that to be true in the way I keep fish. And so I usually at best would pair that with some meds or something. And I'd be doing a multi-pronged approach because whatever my, my normal bread and butter approach didn't work, and so now I'm going, okay, well, the normal thing that works didn't work. I, I better try some stuff because if I do nothing, that's not good either. All right. Oh, and Nikki Fufu coming in with 10 memberships. Boom. Hope you guys enjoy them. What computer do I use? Uh, I, I fight myself if I'm not playing any games. I'm a Mac MacBook person all day long, like an Air usually. Like this, this is a custom computer that costs way too much money that can uh, handle all the processing at 4K with this camera and everything and run these 43-inch monitors. So I want to say it was like four grand and it's just a custom PC from like CyberPower or whatever. I think it's called maybe cyber pc cyber power i think cyber power is like a low end oh right here i'm using this keyboard that came with it i hate this thing i really need to so nerd nerd talk we're, we're far enough in this keyboard came with it and i just set it up and then i bought myself a cool keyboard that's bluetooth the problem is if you don't type on it for a while it loses connection and so when i'm trying to use discord and push to talk 
that doesn't work half the time. So I've got a hundred dollar keyboard sitting there doing nothing. I've got a bunch of keyboards. Well, I've actually got a box of stuff over there and, uh, I keep being lazy. It's one of those, like I could, I, I could choose my better one, but I always have bigger things to do. Like, uh, uh, you know, answer an email or YouTube posts or not YouTube, but Facebook posts or something like that. So one of these days I just need to go, yeah, let me swap in a better keyboard. Cause this one's a little louder than I like. So October member only merch drop better be the mole man costume. Maybe it'll be a mole man shirt, like a brown shirt that kind of looks like a, a mummy or something. How are my koi doing? I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, last year they were eaten by uh, bald eagles. So unless those bald eagles are growing koi patterns, not doing so hot. I don't think. Hey, Corey, I was curious what you put in the setup you built with the cinder block base shelving in the fish room. I may have missed a video. You didn't miss a video. I've done nothing with it. It's currently holding some plants uh, and shrimp for Corvus Oskin. And uh, I, it's sitting there. And, and today, in fact, Randy asked me, are you going to tear that down? And I said, I don't know. Like, <coughs> I said... My priority is to get on top of the tanks I have, and so it doesn't really make sense to be setting up any more. But I also hate the idea of tearing down perfectly good work. Like, it, it's set up and ready to rock and roll. It's, uh, I think it's just I got too much of a good thing going. And so it's like, yeah, I don't need to add another 19 aquariums to what I got to maintain, but I don't want to tear it down either, because what if I get the itch and I want 19 more aquariums to maintain? Hmm. Wireless is terrible. My mouse would would sleep, and then I had to move it. Yeah, I, I typically go wired everything, and uh, I, I wanted to be the Bluetooth guy. <coughs> what camera do I use? This is going to be a weird flex. I'm, this, like, this live stream is on an Alpha 1, the A1. With a G Master lens. That's the only way you can see how imperfect my skin is. Actually, in the super nerdy parts of why would you use a $5,000 camera to live stream <laughs> with a $1,000 lens, it's actually the native ISO on the A1. They have a second, uh, they have a second native ISO at like 3200, which is typically about the uh, exposure range in this room. And so it allowed me to not have these lights be blinding and give me a headache after the live stream, which is a super big plus, and not have to have the video be super grainy. So um, I treated myself to that basically after I was like, all right, I got to commit to these live streams again. And I bought the new lighting and all of that. And I was like, okay, I got to stop having headaches and I got to stop being physically fatigued after a live stream and the biggest one was just the the assault on the eyes because it, it used to have to be uh where did my remote go right here it used to have to be this bright it was let's see if i can get it this bright yeah you can see how i'm like getting real pale now it'd be like this bright and you guys can't see it obviously but uh it it's harsh on the eyes and so you actually, like when I'm filming videos for you guys, like the talking head parts, I'd have to like kind of force my eyes to want to be more open because they want to be like this because it's so bright. And so it's it's stupid, but, you know, basically technology, that's why. And, uh, you know, easier on the eyes. Now, now I've got white, you know, like you close your eyes, you got the bright spots. Now I got that going on. Let me turn this down. So yeah, stupid, expensive camera. Uh, but it does... It does make it, it, the tool actually makes my job easier. It's kind of like seeing Corvus Oskin with a hundred dollar hammer and you're like, but I have a hammer that's $7. And, uh, but you know, if you're swinging a hammer, the weight that you like and the bounce that you like and the head type that you like on that hammer, those all are very important if you're swinging a hammer all day. So 
Okie dokie. Mm. <laughs> and I use an ancient smartphone with a flickery screen. So to be fair, up until like six months ago, I was using an iPhone to do the live streams. And you can, if you go back and look six months, you'll be like, why is everything a little bit extra red and all that? All the, you know, everything was compensating for the low light in here and everything. And so I, I do recommend that. Like it's it's purely a, I, I have the luxury of, of doing this and also I wanted to elevate my game because here's a, a mind-blowing stat that even if you're not a YouTube nerd uh, you will appreciate I think even if you're listening on a podcast the landscape on YouTube has been changing so much that now and I still refuse to believe this is a true stat more people watch YouTube and specifically the Aquarium Co-op channel like it's not just like some random channel, like even our channel in the analytics, more people are watching on a TV now than are watching on a desktop computer. That seems impossible to me. Like that has to be made up, but more and more, like you guys will start sounding off like I'm watching on a TV right now. And so when I, when I kind of realized like, okay, I really need to lean into watching on a TV. I started, some of you may have noticed we started streaming in 4k and streaming in 4K, I wanted to upgrade the camera quality so that when you put it on your 80-inch screen and you get a head this big of my dumb face, it looks as uh, sharp and polished as it can, you know, so when the mole man's doing his dance, you get it in full HD, so, yeah, but it's crazy to, because watching analytics 10 years ago, it was all desktop. And then it was like, oh man, it's tons of mobile. And now it is still tons of mobile, but like, dang, look at, you know, look at smart TVs crushing desktops. You know, it's getting weird when you meet the younger generation. They're like, no, I just have a phone. You're like, you don't, you don't have a laptop. You don't, you don't have, you don't have a desktop. You literally you've only had a phone. You've got a phone and a PS4. Whoa. Mind blowing to me, but I'm, I'm old and crusty. So. See, look at that. Everyone chiming on the TVs. Hmm. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Maybe they'll fix it so you don't have to watch as so many ads on the TV. That's what I hate. Like, Katie will cast stuff there. I'm like, watching ads? What's going on? Because we, we do pay for the premium. And I, I would do that even if I wasn't a YouTuber. Because uh, it's like 20 bucks a month for like the family plan. And we have like three or four people on it. And not having ads... I don't know. It, it just, because the way I use YouTube, I'm trying to go, why is my thing making this sound? Or why is this broken? And having to wait two minutes for an ad, just, I'm already like hot and sweaty and like under the car, like, oh God, just hurry up. No. So yeah, worth it to me. I, I view it as like a $20 look up anything that's broken in my house service and I could probably repair it until a real professional can repair it correctly. YouTube Premium Mole Man. That's right. <laughs> I need to I need to find a, a, a random perk and I could like make another tier of YouTube members of mole mole people. <laughs> oh man. All right. <laughs> We've derailed quite a bit here talking TVs and cameras and uh Ever imagine your face to be on someone's TV? No. And I'll tell you what, you ever want to feel self-conscious? Watch yourself on like a 70-inch TV and be analyzing the audio and the lighting setup and still hating yourself for not carrying down this six-foot box ugh, right there that had this blind that's right here. Eventually, all these blinds will get replaced. That was the prototype. But it's stuff like that. You're like, oh, man, I really need to forever to bring that box down. And, uh, you know, just stupid stuff. It's like when you hear your own voice. You ever heard your own voice on a recording and you're like, I don't sound like that. Turns out we all sound like that. Laptop, but I'm old. That's right. You use a laptop. You're so old. Look how old you are. So old I watch on my TI-83 calculator. <sighs> to be fair, it is getting easier and easier to not even own a laptop or a uh desktop and in fact 
my iPad, I'm using it to edit the book because it can do things that even my laptop can't do because of the pencil and that. And like, it's, yeah. Can we do another Randy Fishroom tour soon? No. I don't think he has a fishroom. He's got a couple tanks in his house set up. Um, but when he moved, he hasn't set up a fish room. So it's just a couple of tanks. That being said, some of you will be delighted to hear. I'll be going to Dean's house on Saturday, and we're supposed to film some videos. So he's finally got his fish room back in order, and so we're going to do some filmmaking. And then we'll release it for you guys. So back in action. Uh, I will I will try to fit uh, some some live streams in. Like on the way back from China. Oh no, I, I didn't book it that extra day. But maybe I'll maybe I'll live stream on Tuesday if we're not too busy, and I'll live stream with Zenzo, and then um, that same week I have a YouTuber, Shrimp Sanctuary, visiting me on the weekend. So maybe maybe we'll live stream there and talk about fish. He's way more nerdy about shrimp than I will ever be, which is awesome. Let's see. According to the offer is still there. I'll put you on the Jumbotron for a wild caught glory coin. Oh, man. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's worth asking. Because I was say, like, Jumbotron where? But I don't want you to get in trouble, like, at work or something. But it would be kind of cool to be on a Jumbotron. If we were going to do it, I'd want to find a way to, like, make the most, ri like, ridiculous commercial or something. Like, not on the Jumbotron. Like, it could just be me. I don't care. But I want it to be, I want it to look like I'm in a Gary V video of like, oh, look at me. I'm so famous. But find a way where it comes off and it's hilarious and I'm self-deprecating and not accidentally make it look like Corey's so full of himself. That's always my fear with a lot of my humor is that, because uh, when you have, let's say, like 10,000 people watch something, you have like seven out of 10,000 that don't get the joke. And they're like, this guy is such an idiot. And I was like, you don't, no, I didn't really think that. That was the joke. You know, I've had to do that on, I've had to do that on Facebook sometimes where people post something in the Facebook group and I have to like go and find in the GIF of the Simpsons, like that's the joke. <laughs> Cause they don't get it. They're like, why would Corey, I can't even remember something so asinine too. Like why would Corey put pizza in his aquarium? You know? And it's like, oh, that's the joke. You wouldn't. All right. Um, oh, there's Shrimp Sanctuary right there. It's like, yes, I'll be there and we'll talk about fish. That's right. Oh, I can't do it in this screen. I was going to give you some mod status while you're here. Uh, we're just going to load, load his bags up with as much stuff as he can fly back to Singapore. He's going to be judging at the... Uh, I think he's judging at Aquashella... Um, shrimp contest and one of the reasons I'm not Aquashell because I'm in China so I, I would go if I was close go to Aquashella if you're within driving distance I can't find it I guess I can't give you mod status because I'm not finding it fast enough and this is bad TV I'm on the old TV where? it's like incognito why can I find it? alright I've given up I've given up and I've moved on. All right. <laughs> so old, I use my imagination to watch the stream. That's pretty much how I make the stream. I just use my imagination. Mm. Oh, there he is. Can I mod him on the fly? Mm, yes. What is this? There's different levels of mods now. Can review and remove chat messages? Yeah, we'll do that one. You can also ban hammer people if you want. All right. Now you get a check mark or something probably. All righty. American Library Convention is the same weekend as Aquashella as well. Oof. You're local to that? Go to that. That one's in Detroit this year, right? Is that true? Mm, I think it's in Detroit. If you're around Detroit, I'm envious because I want to go back to Yesterdog. I was telling my wife about that like three weeks ago. 
Does Robert still work for us? He does not. Uh, right now, he's living his best life, and he's I think he's been in Korea for the past like six weeks. He keeps sending me the coolest pictures of uh, different aquascapes and, and wild fish there and that kind of stuff. He was showing me some saltwater puffers and, and all that kind of stuff. So we're still still talking, but he is uh, traveling right now, which pretty jealous of, not going to lie. That It's a cool place. Are are you on a green screen? How here? Let, let's test the green screen. Let me do my job. Hey, you guys should buy this uh, dual battery powered. No, that's not right. I can't even do my job right. It's not dual battery. It's only one battery. My battery powered dual outlet. There we go. Buy this thing, and then if it was a green screen, I couldn't do this. It would have hit the screen. You would have known it. So no, there's no green screen. And uh, now I can officially say the dual outlet air pump withstands uh, shipping. If they, if they throw it on your doorstep, you'll be fine. No joke, we actually test the boxes that way. We, we try really hard because we're tired of stuff arriving broken. And so we beat the crap out of our boxes <laughs> in testing to uh, give it the best chance. Uh, let's see here. Are we hiring? I don't think we're hiring any active roles. That being said, if you were really trying to get hired on an aquarium co-op, you'd watch us, I think, on Indeed. Is that what our HR people are using these days? I think so. Yeah. I'm trying Fr Fritz Paracleanse to see if it will work. Well, it definitely will work, but if you're trying to, like, use Fritz Paracleanse to, uh, you know, build a baseball field, it's not going to work for that. But if you're trying to take care of internal tapeworms on your fish, that will work. Yeah. Will it not make the plants blue, though? Paracleanse, no colored effect to it. Ickex will, can stain the water blue and your silicone blue, but not the plants or anything like that. <laughs> Is that a scratch and dent item now? No way. That thing's my, my, my on-camera display one. Just like my, my heater box that's ripped over there. I am way too cheap to uh, <laughs> to scratch and dent that thing out. Then I had to get another one. Are we getting the Oliver Knott book soon? As soon as we can finish up the packaging. Yes, it is physically in our warehouse. We are now... that That's a timely segue, actually. We are now ordering and testing boxes. Which... No, well, I shouldn't say no. Like, I would guess a lot of other companies would not be doing that, but the book will be $69.99. So it's an expensive book. It is signed, but we want to make sure it arrives to you in pristine, as pristine condition as it can. Like, there's going to be some marks on it because the guy had to handle it and sign it, and they had to come halfway across the world. Now, don't let, don't, don't let that think like, all oh, these things are beat up. I didn't say that. I just also don't want the guy that's like, I was going to submit it for grading, and it turns out that, uh, you know, someone touched this thing once. Like, yes, we have to touch. We have to put it in a box. But we want the right amount of bubble wrap. We want the right amount of thickness on the box. We want to get it to you in as good a condition as we can. We're going to ship each one of them. Well, I, I shouldn't say that because what if we... turns out we don't. But the current thinking right now is each one ships on its own and not uh, with any other goods you buy. Because we don't want... We don't want to go like, oh, well... UPS dropped it from the Eiffel Tower and it fell and the box of the sponge filter pierced the front cover, right? We want it to arrive just like as good as possible uh, for you. Mm. Ick these days has a whole new meaning. What do you mean? I don't know that. I always find it weird when people are like, everyone knows this thing. And I'm like, but do we? I feel like I'm, I'm in the scene quite a bit and I don't know this. Which, I do learn things all the time. So I'm not saying I know it all, but half the time I'm like, is that a thing? Or is that just like a thing that you think is a thing? Want to do two large sponge filters in a 75 gallon. Would you recommend the dual outlet air pump or the single outlet air pump? I would definitely run the dual. Uh, mostly because you're not going to get that much flow going through each one on that deep of an aquarium if you're trying to split the single into two. 
So I would go with the duel. I wonder if people are ever offended when I give them, like, Toski. I have no idea what his voice sounds like. I'm pretty sure it doesn't sound like the voice I just gave him, but I find it fun for me and maybe other people when I when I give the comments a voice. <laughs> Taco Grease Fingerprints. You have to pay extra for that. There's actually going to be a drop-down menu, and you get to choose which meal I'm going to eat while I read your book. Um, Taco Grease, that one's the cheapest, but if you want, uh, like, uh, what's something I hate? I'm trying to think of some food I hate. Like, that one costs a lot. Who manages the fish room now that Robert's gone? Uh, like the fish store? Like the fish room is still managed by me. You know, always managed by me, but the fish store will be Brandon. Mm, can I get... Wait, can fish get ick on their mouths? Looks like cotton mouth. Uh, I mean, ick cyst could be on like the lip line and stuff like that, but normally you'd be seeing a cyst or... A different disease so yes possible but i don't want everyone to be like oh yeah Co Corey said cotton mouth is actually ick like, no no not that either not that either hmm no one in paris is paying 40 euros postage yeah no one no one in europe pays postage much at all because uh the you know europe's so small you can basically send like we don't understand it as Americans normally because you can basically send anywhere in Europe and it's like, wait, that was $3 and it got there in two days. And then you realize like, oh, the countries, even though it's like, oh, Germany, like that place got to be pretty big, right? Smaller than all of like, not all of our, but most of our states. It's like, oh, I guess it's not that big. So, which makes it super cool to drive around Europe because you're like, look at me, I'm in another place. I sound so fancy. Look at me, I'm in a new place and I sound fancier. Yeah, I, I love it when I can hit extra, extra countries just because we're like, wait, if we take that road, I can say I've been in another country and we can go to like, go eat somewhere. That being said, from Chris Lukup's house, it's 20 minutes to France and I've still never been to France outside of the airport. Every time we're like, should we go have dinner tonight in France? And we always do something different. Because it's it's that classic thing that I'm guilty of. I haven't done most of the stuff in my state of Washington. Because it's like, you can do that any day. Any day you can do that. So. Let's see. Have you made Dean more money or is it the other way around? I would say it's the other way around. Dean's probably made me more money. Probably. Let me think. That's pro I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I, but I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, I'm probably getting the better end of the deal because that. Uh, I don't want to make it seem like, oh, you know what I'm doing for Dean, because that's not the case. Dean, it, it's weird. It's kind of like, imagine you have a, a good friend and you go to dinner once a week. And then someone asks you eight years later, like, well, who do, you, who do you think has paid for more dinners? Like, I don't know. It's probably, it's mutually beneficial. I don't, I don't think we're really thinking of it like that. I mean, we do keep track because we have to for accounting, but, you know, there's doors that open up and, and, and things like that and opportunities. And it, it's definitely, uh, we're better together. We, you know, we're, we're guacamole and chips. Do I like Geophagus? I do. Which one is my favorite? You like Geophagus Tapajos? The reds? I really like Jurapari, but the ones that I really like to keep and I like when people keep them are the Stradici, Geophagus Stradici, the red hump earth eater, because the males try to impress the females by opening their mouth and shaking like an idiot. And whenever you see it in the store or you get to own them, it's hilarious, and I basically laugh every time. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, you're really bringing the ladies on with that look, buddy. It's it's hilarious. How about a mom coin for us geeks? Maybe. I'd have to think. Half the problem is I can think of cool ideas. I just have to think of ways to justify it. Because if I put it like, if I sell a coin for 7 bucks, not that many of you guys are buying coins. If I give it away, I'm like, oh, that's cost me several dollars per one I give away. So I have to like think of a good reason to give it away. Like 
maybe your five or six coin is like the mulm. But also, for something to be commemorated in the the historic mulm coin, it's gotta it's gotta be something that lives on for more than one live stream, right? If it if it dies out and we forget about mulm man, you know, a week from now, then eh, not good enough. But if it lives on, like we should probably make like a flu ball tripping coin first. <laughs> I, I still kind of want to do, I still kind of want to show up to convention and the shirts that we give out, just have it be hashtag flu ball strip it and get like 2000 people wearing it. We just have flu ball be like, what is going on? If they're smart, they would lean into it and just embrace it. And it'd be the best marketing thing ever for them. But there's a 50% chance they get offended. And then that would like totally backfire on them. So like, yeah, I, I, I hope that uh, most of these companies, everything know it's it's lighthearted. We it's better to be lighthearted uh, competitors than it is to be like I'm going to destroy your soul, Fluval. You know, because I I still think they do, and I I will always I will try to always give props to Fluval. They have some amazing products, and of the big aquatic companies, and I consider them to be one of the big aquatic companies. They're killing it. They've got social media and all of that, and they're putting out videos. You know, if I was really going to come down on someone, there's way more like Tetra. You've basically owned the aquatic industry for the last like 60 years. What are you doing? Right. Like you've you had you've got all the money in the world. Pick some YouTubers up and have them do some good things. But there is a notorious bad record of company picks up YouTuber and then they manage to like just make the worst stuff possible. I don't know. I don't know if it's the execs going, no, make it worse. Make it worse. Or if it's they're picking the wrong YouTuber or personality type people. I don't know what it is, but it seems like, uh, you know, matching a personality in the aquatic industry and a company, it's like oil and water from what I see. That's why I'm both. What was what was the one from the last week? Like, not only am I a member, I'm also the president or something. Not only am I a member, I'm also the CEO. Not only am I the owner, but I also represent myself. I can't wait to get a coin. <laughs> it's it's said I've been at it for a year, and I still haven't received one yet. Well, you can always buy the green one. So you can always fast track it, get the green one. Yep, that's real metal. And uh, then you can, you know, you can start working on the one year, the two year, the three year, and the four year. How I still how did I not make it the two no? That's that's what happens when I'm not in product development like that was we had the other company do that and it turned out great but there's a better chance i would have thought about uh thought about it had i been more active in it sir Corey, when are we going to talk about fish well i hit the quota of talking about fish in the first month of this year so knowing that i only talk about fish for one month out of every decade uh looks like 20 33 uh, january 2033 is the next time we'll talk about fish so if you just go ahead and put a reminder in your calendar 10 years or no it's, it's actually a little bit less than 10 years nine years and some change check in on the aquarium co-op channel and uh for that month we will we will be talking about fish i'm thinking about a 125 gallon community tank involving mollies swordtails platies what is it like cut off on me or something? Mm. I don't know where it went. All right. Well, that tank will be fun. It'll be lots of live bears. Sometimes my chat freezes on this on this thing. I don't like it. No, sir, I don't like it. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, LRB has been plugging Tetra Tropical Granules for free for years. If anyone deserves their sponsorship, it's him. Yeah, I've been there, and I've tried to speak on his behalf to get Tetra to work with them, and they're just like, nah, not doing that. And it's like, I, you know, I don't know how to get through to some of these companies. They've got nothing to lose. Like, they'd have to hand that guy... 
500 bucks a year in tetracolor granules and all of a sudden he'd sell 10x what they're selling but you know and i i would do it except we don't have tetracolor granules and he honestly loves tetracolor granules so nothing i can do about that Do I offer a discount to people with aquarium co-op tattoos? I don't want to start that trend. Like I, yeah. So no. While I would, I'd be flattered and I think it's fairly cool. I would also instantly be like, I don't know, that's a good decision. Where like someone got uh, Tazawa's Tanks tattoo. That's a fairly cool logo. I can see that. Ours, though, it's like, um, I, I don't know if that was a good life decision. Or I'd be like, you should have spent that money on, like, tacos or fish food. Am I still working on a bubble diffuser thing for aquarium cloth sponge filter? Yes. Yes, I am. In fact, I filmed a whole video about it. Last week, I took you guys along for the ride of the Aquarium Co-op developing a product process. There's actually five or six pieces that go along with that device that we're doing. But uh, it's being edited and we're going to release it hopefully uh, in a few months. Because we, we don't, if, we, if we hype train it now, people are just going to jam up customer service like... Even if we have a giant thing that reaches out of the TV and is like, hey, this thing won't be available for like a year. Instantly, we'll still get 10 emails a day of people just going like, uh, I know I saw that thing one time. When's it going to be out? And it's like, it's been six hours. We said a year. It literally, you watched the video six hours ago. We said a year. And it was in bold and it had sirens. So the longer we can uh, delay that video coming out, the uh, the easier it'll be on customer service. And we, everyone in customer service, they are, they're being so kind to people. We do everything we can to not add workload to them because it just, you know, no one wants to spend the whole day like, oh, it'll be out when it's out. Sorry. <laughs> Full chest tattoo, a dollar off a hundred or more. It's, it's got to be like, you know, the, it's got to, not chest, I think it's got to be across the abdomen instead of thug life. It's got to be like aquarium co-op life. If I ever, if I ever get, uh, if I ever get a six pack, so clearly this is going to happen any day now. If I ever get a six pack, I might have to do aquarium co-op life. Even though I've never had a tattoo and I'd probably be, it'd probably be painful and I would hate it. But yeah, my wife will just have to live with it. Just just know I'm not getting the six pack so you don't have to look at the tattoo. It's not the other way around. Uh, do I like live or fake plants in my tanks? I prefer live much more than fake. I've got one take with fake ones out there because they're turtles. But uh, I like watching the plants grow. And, and I'm even starting to enjoy plants outside because they grow and they do weird things. And it's fun to... It's fun to admire other people's work too <laughs> so while we might be looking at each other as aquariums and aquascaping when you start dabbling in your own yard you start going like my wife made this comment like we're gonna get pulled over because we're driving like idiots while trying to look at this tree because you see a nice mature tree that's like 80 years old and you're like wow ours doesn't look nearly as cool that we just planted like i hope by the time i'm 80 our tree looks cool and that's kind of the, the thing I'm enjoying about these trees and stuff is it's such a long, like we're planting this tree today, but this thing's not going to look cool and do anything cool for a long time. So it's it's nice, long, uh, delayed gratification on some of this. <laughs> I already have a six pack and I'm just keeping it hidden under a layer. That's right. That bubble wrap, got to keep it safe. Do I have a garden? No, I, what I have is I have a yard. I've got acres of grass that I hate mowing. That's not true. I don't hate mowing. I actually like mowing in moderate amounts. Four hours in the sun is too much. Like an hour? Mm, that is real nice. I actually like that. So we're trying to convert a lot of our grass. So before we bought the place, 
um, the previous owner, he knocked down a ton of trees, like a hundred, not a hundred. That's too many. Like, let's say it's like 40 trees or 30 trees or something and made this big space of grass. Right. And, uh, that's cool until you have to mow four hours of grass every 10 days. And so we're actually trying to bring it back now towards more native stuff. So that's where I like all the ferns and, and a lot of native trees and, not like we're putting, we haven't even started on the back yard. We're still mostly focusing on the, the front yard and taking it slow and steady. And so I've been learning about drip irrigation. I haven't touched drip irrigation since I was trying to be super budget hobbyist and doing an automatic water change using the drip system. And I could never get it to be 100% leak free. Well, I'll tell you what, outside in your garden, that system is awesome. And sure, it drips once every hour. Who cares? It's outside. Inside. You don't want those drips. So um, I'm happy to be working with something so easy to work with outdoors. Because if you, oh, a little bit of water there. Like, I'm trying to put water there anyway. It's kind of nice. Yeah, grass sucks, plant native. That's what we're doing. I don't hate grass. A really nice lawn is nice too. Um, and we're, we won't go with like out any lawn. Because we still like to have family and friends over and set up sprinklers and let the kids just run around and... Uh, have fun. But if we have three acres of grass, I need about, I don't know, a quarter of one acre of grass or less or whatever, right? Like I want some, it's like, yeah, it's an easy quick mow. And the rest is clover fields and ferns and trees and, and bushes. And, and I want it so that we've got bunnies and deer and the coyotes and which I know don't really go together and the possums and the raccoons and the, all the things, you know, we put this feeder in our backyard for birds and now we've got all kinds of birds. And today we had like over 20 birds where when we first put it out, we were lucky to get one bird. And so as word on the street and the bird world's getting out, we are the place to be. We got a big old pond to get your drinks and we got a bird feeder. Yeah, that's right. So we're, we're growing our wildlife, uh, refuge very slowly, but, uh, having a lot of fun doing it. So I try to, you know, try to enjoy nature daily. It doesn't always have to be fish. It can be bunnies and, and deer and coyotes and bugs and other weird stuff. Look at that inchworm, you know, whatever it is. It's all fascinating. So. Hashtag save the bees. That's right. I kind of want to get a nice, I want to get my clover field growing, hopefully. And then I want to get a sign that says I'm trying to help the bees and all that. Because hoping my neighbors won't be like, why does your lawn suck? I'm like, well. If I was better, which I'm not, it would look good and be good for bees. So right now it's, you know, when you're doing that whole conversion thing, it's like, it has to look like crap for like two or three years. Well, maybe it will for me. Maybe, you know, I know there's someone sitting on their couch going, no, buddy, you got to do it X, Y, Z. Like, and I do appreciate when people offer all their insight, but usually I'm trying to take it as a very slow hobby. And so it's like, no, I want to learn though. I just want to, I want to fumble through it. It's, I, I find it very rewarding to be the guy or girl that doesn't know the hobby yet. You're like, I'm going to like, who knew that this plant was so cool? I didn't. So I, I enjoy that. Like oh, I bought this thing. This thing doesn't work at all, but I learned what didn't work about it. And hopefully the next thing I buy, like, oh, that's working out really well. So as I've been playing around with different sprinklers and drip irrigation and drip irrigation, different types of heads and what's the water pressure and what's the run and you know, right now, I'm, tomorrow, I'm hopefully in the second half of the day, when it cools down, I'm going to set up another one. I set up my drip irrigation as a big loop, kind of like I would an air manifold system in a fish room. The next one, I'm just going to run it as a line and see if I get the same type of pressure. Uh, why? Because I'm a nerd and I'm a dork and uh, I got to set up like five different runs because the property is so big and I want to know which one's performing better before I build five more of them. So... You should keep a list of uh, the stuff we see in our yard. Yeah, I think that'd be real fun. In fact, I was thinking about today, I was like, I kind of want to set up a little camera just so I can show you guys the the burb camera. Because, so, you know, we've, we've elevated. We don't want to call them birds now. You, get, you know, once you start kind of loving on birds and you're reading the, the reddits and stuff, you call them burbs. Or if you know people that just like keep birds in their house, they're burbs. And, uh, you know, but the camera would be kind of fun to have in the live stream. You guys could be like, whoa, you guys do have 11 and a half of that bird out there right now. And then you'd see the pond in the background a little bit. So we might set something like that up long-term 
or Katie will totally kill it, or I'll be lazy and it'll never happen. One of those things will happen. Erica Ketchum, new member, signed up themselves. That's how it's done, ladies and gentlemen. That's how it's done. For whatever, for whatever reason, my screen on this end, it froze on the part where it says, where Dorothy just said, yeah, he shook his head like an idiot. Instant attraction. That's, nothing moves after that. It just locked onto that forever. <laughs> That's right, half a burb. No, there's, all our burbs are intact. The birds are just fine. I just, I like to throw out random numbers so that people, like I just assume everyone's like me and you're just passively listening to everything. Until you're like, wait, what did they just say? And then you're like, in theory, I'm hoping it's re-engaging the audience of like, wait, half a bird? That's right, half a bird. Corvids like peanuts? Yeah, we're, we're definitely feeding the squirrel population. And uh, some of the birds love the peanuts too. But peanuts are proportionally expensive and they go through them a lot. <laughs> My wife is laughing quite a bit right now. I'm not sure. It's probably the delay. She probably just heard about the part my screen's frozen on. Mm, let's see here. I'm trying to think of a good way to end this uh, this smorgasbord of being friends, talking about anything but fish. I bought six Ember Tetras from a local fish store. Hold on, I'm going to cough. I floated in the tank for 15 minutes total. Hold on, that's not right. Floated in the tank 15 minutes, total bag time 40 minutes. Okay, that's important. All but one died when I opened the bag. No real temp difference, never made it into the tank. What happened? That's very strange, I would say. In my guesstimation, because that's all I can do, maybe, well, I would say something happened in the bag, which is obvious. Or not in the bag, but the conditions in the bag weren't right. So what could have, like, I like to go, well, how could I have replicated that in my store? How could I have killed 15 fish, or wait, six, six fish in that small amount of time? The only ways I can think of is overheating them. We've had people set them up on their dash and the sun gets to them or maybe in front of a heater. That can happen. I doubt that happened here, but that's one way. The other way I could think of is what if I had just done a massive water change on that tank and put a bunch of dechlorinator in there and the oxygen count was low, then I bagged them up. Maybe that could have done it. Or maybe I had a bunch of ammonia in that tank and didn't note it, notice it and put them in a bag and they were already weak. Maybe that could do it. There could also be a contaminant. Maybe something got into that bag or uh, what can happen sometimes, like I encourage my employees to... Uh, like we, a lot of time, I think most times we don't stock soap in the bathroom in, uh, the employees. Well, no, that's not right. We do, we have it on all of them. I'm trying to think of, I think it's, we use Dawn soap because it's the most easiest one to like dilute out of water. But the premise is trying to make sure that like, don't apply extra moisturizers and other things to your hands while you're going to be in the tanks. Right. And since we all work at the fish store, we're all in the tanks. And so try to save it for after work, something like that. And so maybe someone, uh, you know, put some lotion or something, some contaminant was on their hands and it got into the water in that specific bag. You know, I, I would, it seems very local to that bag though. I assume they looked healthy before you bought them and, uh, you know, something just went wrong. I would, I, so the other thing I always recommend when you have a bad fish batch Go back to the store and see if theirs are doing well. If they're doing well, then you know, okay, it's something isolated. I don't know what it is. You don't always have to figure out what it is. It could be that bag had something wrong with it and it'll never be replicated and we can spend the next 100 years chasing it down or it's fine. <coughs> All right. I vote pH shock. Sure, it, it could be, but in 40 minutes for the pH to change that much, isn't very likely, right? So you'd, you'd have to have the, you know, you got the air in the water and it's only been in there for 40 minutes and you open it up. It would be a pH shock because the person was saying that they didn't even make it out of the bag. So that's not like they pH shocked into the aquarium. It's a, that's a hard one to figure out. 
I would, you know, my first thing is always try it again. I would go back to the store. I'd see how they were doing. Oh, they were doing amazing. I would mention it to the employees or the owner. And hopefully they're like, ooh, that sounds lame. Let me get some new ones. And if they're not, like, okay, well, you know, they're they're probably thinking like, I wonder what this person did, which that happens a lot on a fish store, so I get it. Uh, but if they look good there, I would try them again. If they go great, you'll never know. If they if they do it again, now you've got a pattern, and uh, you'll have been much more astute and uh, watching what was going on on the way home on the second batch, and maybe you could narrow it down a little bit. But yeah, I would just try again, honestly is what I would do. After two times, though, then, then I'd be like, okay, something's up. Yeah, difference between the pH and the bag? Yeah, but the person said they were already dead in the bag, so they never never made it to the tank. So it's something isolated to that bagging process, basically. You know, maybe, for, you know, and the, the, the factors are going to be, you know, the bag, the person putting in the bag, anything that could have made it into the bag, those types of things, heat, that kind of stuff. All right, I hear Dorkula whipping up some dinner, and I'm hungry, and my nerd buddies online want to play some games, so I'm probably going to do that, and I'm 12 minutes over. So, I also got to get up and make sure I'm up, because... The tank can be delivered at like 9 a.m. And that doesn't seem early until you have to have the cargo container open, get the forklift out, and be ready. And the semi-truck driver is super angry because you weren't instantly just sitting there with your forklift to unload it. But I gotta be I gotta be on it. So do yourself a favor. Do the world a favor. Compliment someone this week about their aquarium or their yard or their burbs or their nature or their mulm status, any of those. It'll make you feel better. They'll feel better. And if everybody did that, that means you're getting a compliment too. That makes you feel good. So I'll be hanging out the forum, the Facebook, the videos, the stuff, as always. And I'll try to compliment a few people as I try to solve some problems as well. Ooh, I can smell the dinner. It smells good. I can smell what the Dorkula is cooking, and it's good. All right, I'll see you next time. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for being friendly with me, and uh, we'll see you next Wednesday. Have a good day or night, and good week, good morrow. Bye bye I clicked on the wrong button. Dang it. Wait, wait. Oh, my gosh, I almost did it two weeks in a row. Luckily, I saw it that time. Uh... After this stream ends, which is like right now, we're going over to Primetime Aquatics because I'm playing with the YouTube features that lets us take all of our people. And after this live stream ends, if you do nothing, it's going to put you in his live stream. So if you want to be proactive, you can go over there with me. I will be hanging out there and listening as I eat dinner. And so Primetime Aquatics, it's going to show you when I click the done button. And I didn't want to forget two weeks in a row because that would just make me look dumb. He didn't ask for me to do it. I just told him I was going to do it. And last week, I screwed it up royally. And so this week, I've only half screwed it up. I should have mentioned this earlier in the live stream. But uh, I caught myself right at the end. And uh, now, goodbye for the next, like, 30 seconds till I see you in the next live stream. Bye-bye.